Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. Thanks very much for, for joining us this morning. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Richard Betts. I'm the publisher at uh, Real Asset Media, and we produce around 60 to 70 of these live online events um, just to keep everybody connected and share views and market insights and, and investment strategy on a number of different topics and different sectors. We're particularly looking at European opportunities this morning um, and investing in resilient real estate um, and looking particularly particularly at the retail sector. Um, if you've got questions um, that you want to, to ask or comments that you want to give, on the right hand side of your screen, you will see that there's an opportunity there for comments or, or Q&A. Please do use that throughout. Um, the, the joy of this being live is that you can ask questions, make comments, and we can address them in the, in the conversation. Um, so just in terms of, of this morning, it's going to be a, a, a packed one hour session. Um, we're looking first of all with presentations, looking at the latest research from JLL um, and then also from Union Investment, um, looking at both resilient retail and also a focus as well on, on particularly some of the areas like grocery retail, food retail um, that have proved very resilient during, during the past 12 to 18 months. Um, but let's start first of all um, with the first presentation which is from, um, from Chad Martinez who's Head of Retail Research for EMIR at JLL. Um, Chad, let, let's, let's start with you um, just with your kind of introductory presentation on some of the key themes for, for resilient retail. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me and good morning, everybody. We are nearing a really interesting point in time with regards to um, the current retail market, uh, whereby we're reaching a turning point from both the pandemic, but also from the longer term structural change that we're seeing um, across the retail landscape. And it's absolute delight to be able to talk about sort of our thinking and also help setting the context that we're seeing. Um, and that's also help setting the context for the broader discussion. Starting from uh, starting with the major retail retail markets globally, um, what we can see is that we're starting to see green shoots emerge across sort of the major economies. Initially, um, we, we saw sort of the international demand was really focused on mainland China, where with the country sort of being able to control the pandemic quite early on, and a lot of consumers were able to return to pre-pandemic uh, shopping behavior quite quickly. And as a result, you saw particularly no luxury operators, but also other international brands expanding into uh, the major cities uh, across mainland China, but also into secondary cities, trying to offset some of the lost sales from other retail markets globally. But if we now start to look at the UK and uh, the US, we can actually see that with sort of the successful vaccine rollout, that we're starting to see more interest from coming from retailers looking to take space. And over the first sort of couple of months, we have seen a significant increase in leasing activity, particularly in sort of uh, the major cities. For example, in New York City, where we have seen more um, higher leasing volumes in the first quarter of the whole year as the whole of 2000, but also in, for example, London and across the major shopping centers across the USA, UK, we're seeing a significant uptick in uh, leasing volumes. And what is very striking is that sort of the focus has shifted from initially trying to negotiate bigger discounts towards now trying to sort of uh, come to long term agreements that both work both for the landlord as well as for um, the retailers. If you move on to the next year of group of countries, uh, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, we can see that sort of COVID um, is under control, but we haven't seen as much progress yet in the vaccine rollout. And what we can see there is that consumers are much more cautious. Um, they tend to prefer to shop in sort of the local shopping areas, a trend that we've also seen in Europe last year during the summer period. And what we can see is that retailer demand remains very much focused on taking space in those areas. And as a result, the CBD areas are still seeing a lot more consolidation at the moment and also more um, selective opportunistic expansion, but the overall volume still remain muted. And if we look at sort of the last group of countries, particularly sort of uh, France, Germany and Spain, over the past couple of months, we have seen governments really working hard to try to get the COVID infections rate uh, down again. And what we can see is that there has been much more cautiousness amongst retailers looking to take space across Europe. Of course, the well-capitalized operators, such as grocery operators, do-it-yourself operators, and also um, uh, some F&B operators have actually actively looking to take space, but we can see that overall volumes are more muted in comparison to pre-pandemic levels. And also in terms of the, the types of deals that are being structured, we can see that's a larger sort of adoption of incentives as well as step up, step rents, as sort of retailers sort of try to navigate these uncertain times. 
But I think the key takeaway from uh, what we're seeing across the markets is that the prospect of a safe return from consumers is really acting as a turning point for the retail leasing markets with consumption to come to, to pick up again and also retail demand to strengthen again. If we look forward over the next sort of three to five years, we really anticipate a swift recovery in uh, retail spending. And there are sort of four contributors to this strong recovery profile. First and foremost, the European, various European markets have implemented job retention schemes. And this has really been designed to help, of course, protecting jobs, but also disposable income levels, as well as um, trying to help avoid a strong erosion in consumer confidence over the long term. And ultimately, this will help to sort of uh, the retail market to bounce back more quickly as people are more willing and able to spend. And just as a comparison, with sort of still the uncertainty in the current market, we still anticipate uh, unemployment to, to, to further increase. And ultimately, during this crisis, to see around three and a half million people to lose their job, unfortunately. But if we compare this towards the global financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis, we can see that this is a completely different level and a much better position uh, sort of to bounce back as an industry. And the second point, with a lot of consumers not being able to sort of go out last year with the uncertainty that the pandemic uh, has caused and continues to cause, is we can see that a lot more households have actually saved a lot of money last year. HSBC, they, they sort of um, estimates that across the Euro Eurozone and the UK, households have saved over 665 billion euros more in 2020 than 2019. And this is likely to be sort of uh, deployed in, the retail, in, in retail spending as we go forward. And this brings us to the third point, there are sort of anticipation that this that the saved up money will not perhaps be deployed immediately, but some research from McKinsey and company also illustrate that 42% of the European shoppers, they do anticipate to splurge or treat themselves that uh, once the re restrictions have been lifted. And this will particularly apply on sort of uh, the aspects that consumers have not been able to do, such as travel, uh, fashion, uh, health and beauty products and other sort of out of home uh, activities such as restaurants and socializing again. And the last contrib contributor will be tourism. With the reopening of uh, economies, we anticipate a strong bounce back in, in tourism, initially driven by uh, a recovery in domestic demand. And this will gradually flow into sort of also recovery in international air travel, from ex example, business travelers, as well as um, sort of individual travelers. And the overall expectations are is that the, 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 the total volume of air travelers will be back uh, by 2019 levels in 2023. And this will also ultimately help to sort of further drive the recovery in the retail market. So what does this mean then for the overall retail sales growth as well as the, the growth for the various um, categories? With the reopening of economies, we anticipate that uh, retail sales as a whole will grow 2.4% uh, over the next five years on average. If we then sort of look at the various channels, such as online, we anticipate online sales to, uh, to continue to grow. But of course, after the strong acceleration that in, in growth that we have seen last year, we anticipate growth to soften. And, the growth rates on average will work out at the 3.4% um, on average. With the reopening of um, economies, we also anticipate more consumers to actually sort of uh, go back to uh, the offices again, to, uh, to go back to restaurants and bars again. And as a result, people might actually um, rein in some of the spending that they have um, the spending in, in, in grocery stores or food stores. And as a result, we actually anticipate a marginal decline as a whole um, to take place this year in overall retail spending and a gradual recovery going forward. But the main beneficiary of this whole shift in the reopening and shift in retail spending is particularly the non-food sales area, which constitutes for a large part our high streets, our shopping centers, our retail parks, as well as our factory outlet centers. This is where we anticipate a strong bounce back in uh, retail spending, obviously coming from a low base, uh, but it's encouraging to see that um, this is a sector that is set for a strong recovery um, in retail spending. And if we go on to the chart on the right hand side, it's particularly the countries um, that have been hit hardest last year that will obviously see the strongest bounce back um, in retail spending. But what is very encouraging is that with the strong bounce back in retail spending will also give us more clarity around sort of where sustainable rent levels will be for the various retail assets across the landscape and ultimately to help, will help us to better price assets and that will ultimately also help to bring more liquidity in the retail investment market over the next 6, 12, 24 months ahead of us. 
In terms of the retail leasing market, this is still where we can see a lot of change happening uh, in an accelerated way. Obviously, various major retail operators that operate very large store formats, think about the major fashion operators, think about some of the health and beauty operators. This is where we can still see a lot of consolidation to take place um, with, 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 with retailers trying to um, close down underperforming stores or stores where they believe they would not have a future anymore in the omnichannel uh, landscape. And what is encouraging to see is that for the remaining stores that some of these retailers they actually have announced to say we're going to sort of also commit significant capex in improving the store experience and also making sure that the stores are better suited to operate in omni-channel um, environment. If we sort of move on to the second group, this is where we uh, can also start to see much more change that will come to the retail market. We can see that various major retail groups are introducing new store formats. Think about fashion operators that, for example, open up beauty halls, but also um, think about retailers that are starting to introduce more rent subscription models in terms to make sure that sort of they diversify their income stream, but also sort of make it more attractive to other um, consumers who are perhaps not necessarily willing to pay out the full price and happy to sort of own or at least use the specific products in the more shorter term. And then sort of the last group, opportunistic growth, we can see various uh, retailers who haven't necessarily built up sort of the larger store presence yet to so actually um, expand. And think about um, operators and electric vehicle manufacturers who are um, both cars and uh, cyclists who are now starting to open up um, a space. Think about, for example, uh, retailers who have a sustainability product offering who are now starting to look to take more space. Um, and we can sort of also uh, see additional demand coming from, for example, retailers who very much believe that sort of the distribution, the direct to consumer business model will be a very strong business model to go forward. And among some of those are the sports uh, retailers who are now actively looking to take more space and try to sort of organize uh, more around the sales of their own um, business. And I think the key sort of message here is that we continue to see um, consolidation and as a result on a net net basis, the retail market will see and there will be less demand uh, for retail as a whole, but it's very clear that retailer demand is pivoting towards either the, um, the experience-led shopping destinations on the one hand, and also towards the more convenience-orientated retail places on the other hand. And this will ultimately give us more clarity. And this is also bringing us to the last slide uh, of the presentation. I've briefly spoken about uh, the, the turning point that we're seeing in the retail market with sort of the first green shoots emerging, uh, appearing across Europe, and also sort of the strong, strong bounce back in retail spending that we're anticipating. I've also mentioned sort of the accelerated sort of change that we're seeing in the re on, on the retail leasing market and on the sort of particularly around sort of the retailers. And I think what is very positive here is that this accelerated change will provide retailers as well as investors clarity on what space will remain relevant and ultimately also productive for the European retail market. This is where I leave it. Richard, I will hand over the presentation back to you. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Chad. Um, really interesting, really interesting presentation. There are lots for us to pick up in the panel. Um, and uh, the next presentation is gonna be from Henrika Valberg, who I'm sure lots of you know um, as Head of Investment Management Global for Union Investment Real Estate. Um, and also, interestingly, um, there's a very good um, research report that's just been launched um, by both Union and JLL on the European grocery real estate markets. Um, and you'll have noticed that I've, I've put a link. If you look in the chat, um, I've put a, a link to that so you can access that as well. Um, but, um, but now, Henrika, um, if we can hand over to you um, just, to, just to kind of share your views there in, in terms of the research as well um, on particularly this resilient retail side. Henrika. Oh, Henrika, you're on you're on mute, I think. That's bad. Perfect. Can you see? Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Thanks very much, Henrika. Okay, fantastic. I'm sorry. Yeah, ultimately some lights at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much, uh, Jad, and uh, thank you very much, Richard, for the introduction. Um, we see lights at the end of the tunnel. Um, however, we do believe that um, let me try to move this. Sorry. So, um, however, we uh, while different sectors and companies bounce back at a different pace and magnitude, we accept to see the underlying recovery uh, not to be 
even, unfortunately. So to say assortments of the retail sector in the past 12 months um, would be really an understatement. So the key point is which formats uh, will meet the future customer demand uh, really. And I think to believe on this, and I hope now my slide will move properly now. Um, you need to differentiate between the temporary and the structural uh, trends uh, in the first instance. And you really need to understand which trends are um, temporary uh, and which are, will be evolutionary uh, to the retail sector. Let's look into the food and proximity sector uh, where we did this study on, uh, Richard was just mentioned. Um, as a short-term recognition of the pandemic, certainly sales levels have been uh, elevated uh, through the pandemic. Post-pandemic, though, we believe that uh, the sector will return to a traditional growth pattern of 0.5 to 2%. Uh, it's a great sector. It's the biggest retail sector uh, in Europe. And um, I think the, the result of our study also revealed that uh, it's a very structurally sound and resilient sector uh, to be invested uh, in. The price elasticity um, in this sector is low. People still have um, to eat. Let's look into the omni-channel retail. Um, I think it's fair to say that online um, has achieved an evolutionary leap. This is clear. A five years um, compression or a five years um, uh, estimated uh, development in online retail sales simply have been compressed uh, in a couple of months uh, during the pandemic. So that the massiveness of this growth uh, can be uh, lowered and um, this is going uh, assumed to be go down, I think it's something which shows already recent studies and we saw this very impressively in different markets uh, such as in Poland where um, online sales um, did go down uh, indeed after the lockdowns uh, have been um, um, uh, uh, eased. Nonetheless, uh, online retail, I think, like it's, this is also clear, is an established um, uh, consumer channel. And um, I think like during the lockdowns, also elderly people who are maybe less online if he have been adapting uh, to this. Um, I think like on a positive note here, we do believe that um, ultimately the, um, the, the retailers as such have recognized that they need to invest into this space. And I must say, this must not necessarily have been the case uh, in previous times. So uh, if we look into the different subsectors um, of Omnichannel, um, I think uh, click and collect was one of the main drivers um, of the online sales growth during the pandemic. It was driven, of course, by safety uh, concerns and scarcity. Shops were closed. Click and collect were the only ways uh, um, to buy goods partially. And the beauty of this click and collect is that it's one of the best digital retail integration tools. Um, and it could mean also like for the retailer that it reduces the cost of online order fulfillment substantially. Yeah, I mean, I think that this must, um, um, I think like a necessity to the success of this click and collect is that the service is attractive for the customer. The structural change for the retail real estate is that it means that retail space partially converges into uh, industrial. And um, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, the store will serve um, the micro fulfillment and, um, and it will also evolve the store size uh, and layout. So part of the store will go dark to, uh, to serve as a micro fulfillment center um, of online deliveries. Um, new technology um, uh, is certainly accelerated. Um, and I think it's also uh, not new um, that the ability to serve both uh, digital and stationary retail in a seamless consumer experience, um, for especially focusing on timing and ease, uh, easing, uh, will be a key successful uh, factor looking forward. And uh, I think like there are already great firms and initiatives uh, using inno innovative technology. This is also, by the way, a very interesting, uh, we figured out in our um, uh, grocery study that uh, also um, the, the food industry is using already uh, great in-store technology in order to improve the customer uh, experience. And we have great examples uh, in our study. Let's move away from the uh, from the uh, 
uh, online retail or omnia channel and let's look into um, the, a very big theme uh, which where we believe it will be evolutionary, uh, evolutionary to retail which is sustainability i think like it's also um, fair to say that consumers are more aware than ever um, of the environmental and uh, ethical implication of the products they buy today. So, um, and I think um, uh, like all the discussions we had in the past on online retail, and we have many studies uh, on this, it suggests that online retail um, um, is less eco-friendly than uh, than the stationary uh, retailing. So, I mean, we have waste of packaging, we have the traffic by online deliveries, we have return goods, um, and uh, it's also a big secret of the online retail, uh, what's actually the percentage of uh, return goods. And uh, we, I think like we read many articles about uh, like these returns goods immediately sent to, uh, to a landfill rather than being recycled, reused or resent to customers um, again. So um, we could say that uh, this is um, a unique opportunity for the stationary retail to use this as a USP looking forward. Yeah? But I think it's not being so easy. It really needs a common effort and strategies to help people to make responsible uh, purchases. To the other side, um, we do believe that we will see also a big evolution uh, in, the, in, the, in the tenant mix. And I think like Jad also alluded, uh, to this, obviously, um, we have an entire interruption in the restaurant, fitness, wellness, beauty services. They're struggling and the, many of them are uh, even close to bankruptcy or already bankrupt. Um, as a matter and as a result of this, we do see obsolescence uh, in our properties, obsolescence of space because it's, it's free now. But it's just... Um, we do believe it's just an interruption of a successful uh, business and long term um, it will also be a key factor um, for landlords and retailers to continue to evolve the experiential offering with social, with cultural um, uh, and a community at the heart of, uh, of retail real estate. The leisure and restaurant industry will come back. It will take a strong effort by landlords um, to repopulate actually the tenant base. I mean, there, there are uh, signs of hope. Um, as on the leasing markets, we see new and uh, innovative concepts coming up and uh, Jart explained this uh, earlier as well. Um, it's also, we do believe, a great opportunity to transform space uh, even further uh, to make it attractive uh, and engaging for our customer. Coming to my last slide here, what is resilient retail? Um, I think uh, it's also a good opportunity to hand over uh, to the panelists here. Certainly short term, Amazon and online retail um, are pandemic profiteers, that is, um, that is clear. But I think like the long term question is uh, who will win a lasting consumer's uh, retention? And um, I would be very happy if we could uh, discuss on this point um, with our moderator and our panelists. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thanks very much, Henrika. Um, really, really interesting two presentations there. Um, a lot of food for thought for the panel. Um, thanks very much for, for the questions, Oliver Kummerfeld. I see you've already gone straight out of the traps and put one in there. We'll come to that shortly. Um, let me just introduce, introduce the panel. Um, so as well as Chad and, and Henrika, we've also got uh, Dr. Angelus uh, Bernruter, who's Head of Investor Relationship Management for Kaufland. Um, we've got Mike Bellhouse, who's Director, Head of Retail Investment, Man Retail Investment from the Cap Market side at JLL. We've got Sasha Wilhelm, who's uh, CEO of X Plus Bricks. And uh, last but not least, Carol Zeman, who's uh, Senior Portfolio Manager um, for the Shopping Centre Funds at, uh, at CBRE Global Investors. So a really interesting mix of people. Um, and it'll be great to, to, to get your kind of views on that as well. Um, let's start just with brief introductions so that everybody knows everybody else. Um, Carol, let's start with you. Just just a kind of brief minute on, on yourself and, uh, and the company. Thanks. Hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, yeah, as you said, I'm the uh, portfolio manager for European Shopping Center Fund with CBRE Global Investors, managing uh, 13 assets uh, across uh, pretty much all of Europe um, with the company for 15, 15 years. Super, great, thanks very much. Um, Sasha. 
Good morning, everybody. My name is Sasha Wilhelm. I'm uh, the founder and CEO of the Exxon Bricks Group. Uh, we are a uh, specialist investment company for grocery real estate um, in, in Germany, as of now, founded in 2018, and having a portfolio of uh, 1.1 billion roughly in grocery uh, stores all across Germany. Great. Thanks very much, Sasha. Um, Mike. Morning, everyone. Uh, Mike Bellhouse. Um, I've had the pleasure of working at Jones Lang now for, or JLL now for, the best part of 20 years, most of which has been in retail. Uh, I am responsible for the retail capital markets business across Europe and have worked with everyone on this panel. And, you know, we have the luxury of, of a helicopter view, I guess, of the retail world across Europe with our troops on the ground and have been involved in in excess of 50 billion euros worth of transactions over the last five, six years. Um, and uh, and look forward to that continuing because we absolutely believe that that the, there is a place for physical retail going forward. And, and you know, in line with Henrika's thoughts and Chard's presentation, um, are looking forward to kind of seeing that emerge as, uh, you know, once again. Great, thanks very much, Mike. Um, Angulus. Thanks, Richard, for handing over. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to contribute uh, on this important discussion on the future of retail. My name is Angelus Spanreuter. I'm Head of Investor Relationship Management at Kaufland. Kaufland is part of the Schwartz Group, which is one of the global leaders in food retailing. We run about 1,300 hypermarkets all across Europe with a strong focus on Germany and the CE countries. And uh, now we're happy to discuss uh, uh, the future. Great, thanks very much, Angela. Um, and uh, Henrika, just just briefly on yourself and Union as well, for those who, who may not know, I'm sure everybody does, but uh, just who may not know. Yeah, thanks uh, a lot. I mean, also for the brief introduction earlier on, Henrika Waldburg uh, with Union Investment since 15 years, uh, now working in, uh, in the retail space and more and more on global markets. Thank you. Super, thanks very much, Henrika. And just briefly from you as well, Chad. Thank you. My name is Chad Martinez. I've been now with over 10 years uh, working as a retail expert within JLL and work closely together with Mike Bellhouse and the rest of his team to advise clients and retailers on what we're happening, what's to help them with the strategies. Super. Thanks very much, Chad. Um, I'm going to come to some of the questions in a minute. Let me let me just just pick up on a on a couple of things though. Um, maybe maybe let's start with you, Carol. I mean. We heard there that there's um, green shoots beginning to appear, um, but what's your sort of overall view of, of the market, particularly the, the retail and shopping centre market? Um, I mean, do you see do you see the sector shrinking in investment terms? What, what, what's your sense of what's I guess is your overall view, Carol? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. Um, indeed, uh, the K-shape recovery, which has been presented, I think it doesn't work just for the operational, but but also for the investment market. And I think we we have to say that the market has been oversupplied before, and that we will see shrinking of of the total GLA in the retail market. But uh, indeed, there will be a differentiation be between between types of products, and there will be some which will grow faster than so far, and there will be some which actually even probably disappear uh, in uh, from the market. So uh, we believe that within the next few years, we will really see that happening live. There will be some shopping centers, the less successful ones, which will close down or repurpose, and there'll be some which will provide great returns for the future. Great, thanks, Carol. I'm, I'm going to pick up now just on a, on a couple of the things that have, the questions that have come in. Thanks, uh, Oliver, for these great. Um, Let's let's just pick up first of all on on this one, which is: Are we too optimistic about the effect of a bounce back in retail sales for, for physical space? Um, there is a pent up demand, but wealthy households will hang on to their savings, and people losing their jobs when furlough schemes end will remain cautious. Um, maybe savings rates will remain higher for longer over uncertainty. Plus, some retail spending will likely be online for good. Um, so just interesting to pick up that that's a kind of challenge to that that kind of view of of a more i suppose optimistic view on on the bounce back um i mean mike from from your point of view you're looking you know you mentioned that helicopter view across europe what are you seeing there in terms of i i guess the resilience of that that bounce back 
Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think I completely understand where Oliver's coming from. In all honesty, I think one th one message we've tried to kind of portray, and I know uh, the rest of the panel has as well, it, it's definitely not a one size fits all, and it's going to be a two paced recovery across Europe, no doubt about it, as Henrika alluded to. Um, I think you'll find in Germany, he's probably right in that uh, I think it's a natural instinct of some other countries when they earn money to spend money uh, more readily, such as the Southern European countries. And I think in Chad's slide, he showed that retail sales growths were a lot more kind of uh, uh, optimistic in France, Spain, Italy than they were in Germany, UK and Netherlands, for example, which is, you know, is, is very much down to the consumer behaviour in those respective countries and uh, and something that we've all witnessed and known for an incredibly long time. But uh, so it will be two paced. It will not be the same across those markets. And, you know, the what on one hand, you know, with what Carol was saying earlier is absolutely the retail marketplace will be smaller. I think, you know, we're used to transaction volumes of in excess of 50 billion euros on the whole every year. And last year it was the best part of 30. I think we'll see a normalized market on the investment side of around anywhere between 30 and 40. Please don't hold me to that, but but ultimately it has to shrink given the, you know, the dilution of GLA as well. Um, but but we are positive on where people are saving and earning money that they will spend it. I think there is a huge amount of frustration. It might well be a short lived bounce in the near term, but I think that will normalize over the medium term. OK, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, Angela, so I just wanted to come to you, um, obviously, from from the retailer perspective. Um, I mean, the, the pandemic hit retail, but again, you know, that's different across different sectors. So I guess it would be helpful just to get an understanding of, I suppose, your experience over the last sort of 12 to 18 months and whether or not that's had an impact on, on your strategy at all. Yeah, thanks. So, so to keep the answer short in the first way, as no, there, there has not been a change in our fundamental strategy. So good news is in that the case, and I want to point out that uh, we still believe in brick and mortar stores and we keep expanding in physical retail. But of course, one year ago, uh, our situation was completely different. And then the black swan accord to this unlikely event that came through with far reaching consequences for all of us, as we know. So we are all on the way to a new normal. But what will this new normal be uh, like? What, will, what does that mean for retail and retail real estate in the future? Um, well, um, first of all, the long term trends did not disappear. Also for us as a, as a food retailer and Henrique also already pointed out some of them. Um, they perhaps they were overlapped by COVID. Perhaps uh, they were even accelerated by the pandemic, but they will come back to the agenda. And that's for sure. Um, and to such long lasting trends uh, as uh, uh, sustainability, digitalization and more urbanity, um, uh, there has been added uh, recent aspects under the roof of social distancing. And that's home office, that's homeschooling, very funny for all of them of us uh, who have children at home. And of course, that's home shopping. Um, so what does that mean for the future? Um, well, we, we also did a study some uh, by end of uh, last year, footfall anchors in the post corona age, uh, five propositions for the new future of retail. And in that case, thanks Enrique also for contributing on that study. And uh, to keep it short, uh, the results for us also as a retailer are, well, uh, first of all, the strongest evidence is really is sustainability in all the variety. Second is, uh, no doubt about it, uh, digitalization will drive our business, will drive our interaction with the customer, also in food retailing. Next thing is mixed use assets are on the move. And in that case, also uh, more change, more need for revitalization too. And then that uh, game, uh, of course, food retailing will play a major role. Uh, but I wanted to point out we, we uh, basic footfall is good footfall but we won't save entire locations at, a, at its own. But we are very convinced that food retailing will stay the main footfall anchor in the future. OK, interesting, Angelus. Thanks very much for that. Um, 
Sasha, I wanted just to come to you. Um, what have you been seeing in, in, in terms of the market? Because obviously you've been focusing on um, investment into sort of grocery, um, retail, real estate. So I, I suppose what, what have you been seeing in, in terms of your strategy over the last 12 months? Well, as some some might say that our decision to focus entirely on grocery real estate when we founded the business in 2018 was 18 was somehow visionary, uh, which which it which it which it wasn't. But uh, we were looking for a really uh, resilient cash flow orientated uh, um, business model and, and investment profile within within real estate while we were thinking back in 2018 that a lot of other asset classes were very peaking when it came to to valuation we we were seeing that grocery from a real estate perspective was uh, was not there yet uh, and big uh, institutional capital was not following the sector so far that's why we were deciding for the for that sector and um, yeah, I mean, since then, since 2018, we were uh, able to build up our portfolio, but we can clearly see um, there's a lot more investor appetite for the for the grocery real estate sector now for for many different reasons. It's um, it's uh, long term walls. Uh, it's CIP. It's CIP linked. Um, you have uh, the, the, I mean, you have the best covenants that you can think of with uh, with the big uh, German re retail groups. Um, you have a kind of monopoly because of uh, very restricted zoning zoning in the sector, um, in, in especially in, in in Germany. There is a somehow high resilience to to online to online threat. There will be new formats, of course, with click and collect as we see. But there are a lot of challenges for for grocery in Germany to completely um, uh, come to come to come to online sales, last mile logistic, high costs, uh, um, uh, consumers that are very very um, uh, cautious when it's when it's about pricing. Uh, margins for the retailers that are low already compared to, compared to others. So, uh, I mean, what we can clearly see is a is a yield compression, significant yield compression in the in the grocery sector, and and a lot of new players coming coming to the market, funds, uh, institutional capital, uh, family offices, um, all of them. So, um, uh, we were uh, quite a year ahead of the pack and trying to remain that 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 position, but it's uh, it's getting more crowdy in the sector. That's what you can clearly see. Great, thanks, Sasha. Um, it'd be interesting actually to pick up with with anyone else that that point Sasha raises there about um, capital coming into into the sector, because obviously there's been a lot of negative sentiment in terms of investment markets around retail as a whole. Um, but what are we seeing? Are we beginning to see capital coming back into the sector, but into these specific areas? What what's the situation there? Does does anybody want to to pick yeah, that up in terms of the capital? Richard maybe I'll, I'll jump in here just quickly because obviously we, we work on behalf of a lot of the capital that's in this market and Sasha's is absolutely spot on i think 15 years ago i be i was working in food store portfolios in germany and and the the kind of principal market was was local very local to the specific area almost the sort of small pension funds and or high net worth or private individuals and trying to get Henrika to do a food store portfolio 10 years ago was almost almost impossible whereas if you compare that to the UK where retail warehousing or food anchored retail warehousing has long been a hugely institutional product um, and arguably the most outside of the very prime high street the most expensive of the retail products given the restrictive planning as Sasha said the long term leases plus the access to growth that's now completely changed and we've almost flipped completely the other way for the very reasons that Sasha has explained in that in Germany you've always had low rents on the food stores capped by indexation hurdles but to good covenants so it's a very good and sort of defensive let's call it investment product which is why I was always very surprised the institution didn't like it back then and then the UK has gone the other way where rents have gone out of kilter in, almost with turnovers because you've never had that transparency or basis of turnovers to set the rents and you know we're, we're talking yields in the uk of seven eight nine percent plus for the same product in germany you're talking yields of five percent minus um and and it's you know it's it's interesting to see they're probably the two largest markets in that category in europe there's less product available in other markets it's not to say that there wouldn't be the same amount of demand but again it's that whole uh you know one size fits all uh, when you're when you're speaking to press and or capital about 
retail as, as one concept it's, it is ridiculous and we're starting to see that from the capital who are starting with a defensive product like Sasha was saying and investigating retail warehousing or the very prime high street at the moment and I think what we'll see and Carol and I were debating this yesterday is a slightly latent swing into the shopping centre world where you'll start seeing post lockdown retailers starting to perform again, consumers starting to spend on experiential, a bit more luxury, let's call it, um, over the short to medium term. So I think we'll see a latent bounce in shopping centres, um, but I think we're seeing a huge amount of demand in the more defensive retail products such as grocery now, particularly in Germany um, and Northern Europe, and starting to spread into other areas of Europe at the moment as well. OK, good. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'd like to drill down into that a, a little bit. Um, Maybe with you, Carol, um, just in terms of that particularly, and I'll pick that up with, with you as well, Henrika, um, but just in terms, Carol, of that shopping centre side, um, going forward, what's going to make her, uh, I mean, Mike's talked there about the differentiators, what's going to make a, a, the difference between what will be a resilient, well-performing shopping centre and, and one that won't? And, and I suppose, our owners like CBRE Global Investors and indeed Union already moving in that direction. What's the position? Yeah, I think the the, the very simplest answer would be the, the one word dominance. If you are dominant in any, any definition, then you will be the winner in the long term. You can be super large, you can be super centrally located, you could be super convenient, or you can be just simply the more most dominant in its catchment area. It's not about the big beasts. It can be a medium sized shopping center if it has a clearly defined catchment and clearly defined competition, meaning no competition. If it's a very competitive market, then there will be assets which will struggle, as, as I said, and th those will be those which will eventually disappear. So we as a, as a house are not afraid of going into even medium sized or, or smaller places as long as there is dominance in 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 the market. So um, yeah, also what Tiart showed in, in, in his presentation, there seems to be pretty solid outlook for the non-food retail and quite, quite a solid bounce back. And yes, we can argue if it's too optimistic or not, but it, if you combine it with the, because this is total, right? But if you combine it with shrinking of the market in, in, in general, that could be quite a positive outlook for for some, but can I steal actually all one minute of, of this to have a question towards Sasha actually, because when when I saw those stats on food retail, which half a percent, I believe, I'm not sure if positive or negative now, but that was the next five, five years, so less the, than the others. And the fact that you bought the portfolio in the time when, um, when it was comparative or comparably cheap, now everyone is running for uh, grocery, yields going down. Are you considering selling actually? Not at all, no. I mean, we don't we don't need one one full minute for that answer. I, the clear answer is no, no, we're not. We're, we're here to stay and we're further uh, consolidating the market. I mean, Xbrix was was founded and, and is still um, to to build the, the the one dominant German uh, grocery uh, real estate real estate company, that's what we're planning to do, um, and that's uh, that that's where we're still on track. I mean, we're yes, we see the yield compression, but we all of the deals that we have been doing in the past, we have been able to secure most of them um, off market. That will change, of course, and yields will compressing, and it, it's it's going to be more more competitive. But I do think that um, with with a lot of repositioning that we did in the sector, with a lot of uh, uh, detailed and 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 very good trusted network to the to the grocery retailers and the top management there themselves. We do have a competitive advantage uh, to work in that sector as a as a real specialist compared to others, and that's what we are that's what we're doing. So um, now it's forty seconds. Um, we're here to stay, and we will uh, uh, we will be uh, consolidating that market and trying to consolidate that market. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks, Sasha. So. Uh, so if anybody's looking to buy anything um, from Sasha, that's obviously not going to happen. <laughs> um, let's 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 just pick up. Um, I, I wanted to just pick up. Um, there's there's lots of questions coming into the into the Q and A, so I will be coming to those. So thanks very much for that, and um, do keep those coming. Um, 
Henrik, I just wanted to, to pick up with you on, on the point from that I asked Carol there is in, in terms of um, shopping centres, um, what do you see as, as, I suppose, the things that can make that more resilient in terms of, of retail and go, go to the point you mentioned also about um, the competition, I suppose, for, for attention from the consumer? Yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, it's a good question, actually. Um, um, just stealing a second from this question uh, as well, coming back to what Mike just said. So uh, actually, we are invested in the food and proximity sector since, uh, I don't know, since the company is existing, as it was all, always part of our strategy. I think the point here is uh, obviously that um, our open-ended funds are, uh, like in the medial recognition, more uh, more known for its big shopping center investments. But uh, it's indeed has always been part of our uh, strategy, as we do believe food and proximity on the one hand side and the engaging experience uh, and, a, and a shopping destination on the other hand side. These are, so to say, the two columns of our investment strategy. However, um, we do believe that also, like especially uh, on the big shopping centers and what we call destination shopping, there, uh, there, there, there was an evolution ongoing since quite a while and will, it will continue. The question is, what could, what could we actually do uh, in order to support this uh, evolution? I think um, we have a couple of great examples in our portfolio. Um, uh, Let's talk about sustainability for uh, a second. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's a difficult thing because like we just provide the the real estate. We can make sure that our buildings are sustainable, and we need to make sure this it is uh, will not, not last, but not least be a, a requirement by the climate protocol and uh, and. Uh, EU, but also national legislation, uh, pretty soon. But what can we do also on the on a tenant mix on product uh, side? And uh, what we're doing here is, uh, like, let's say you could pick um, retailers with a special focus on sustainable uh, products. And I think like it's a must have um, today to have uh, sustainability uh, standards. Um, um, also, like let's say in the two different uh, categories, ESG. So that's that's a very big thing. Um, uh, we do competitions uh, in order to uh, find new innovative concepts. Um, uh, we're launching this uh, again uh, in our Alexa shopping center um, with a special focus on sustainability. So we also try to, uh, to, uh, to find a uh, new concept also fulfilling the need of sustainability. I could mention uh, many more initiatives we're currently undertaking. Um, uh, in this space, but also um, uh, uh, to 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 create the versatile tenant mix, uh, which we do believe is uh, a key driver of our successful shopping centers in the future. Great, thanks, Henrika. Um, a couple of questions coming in. Um, th there's one here for you, um, Angela. So yeah. um, I I'll I'll come to that. Um, and this one, Angelus, was uh, was particularly looking at what kind of stores um, that you're looking for. Um, so um, size, location, uh, is Kaufland looking for, um, have your requirements changed in recent months? So uh, interesting one there. In terms of the real estate side, what are you looking for, Angelus? Well, uh, generally speaking, we're looking for locations uh, with, say, uh, a letterable area from 2,000, 2,500, depends on the country, uh, square meters up. So uh, we run big hypermarkets and we do believe in big concepts, but we are not as big as, as uh, someone might uh, have suggested uh, some years ago, five uh, or, uh, or 6,000 uh, square meters up. We can do so, but we begin at a very uh, earlier stage. And that means we uh, also keep expanding. And I point out with physical stores, also in smaller countries, so say from a population uh, with 10 to 20,000 people in the core catchment area and say 25, 35,000 uh, uh, pop uh, population in the, in, the, in the real catchment area. And that means we're also going to uh, new locations, into new towns, and we are happy to expand also with our footfall anchor formats in the future. So many of the new formats will also go into, perhaps also into shopping centers, which haven't been anchored before by a big hypermarket. Might also be in inner cities, uh, if the requirements for parking uh, and so on are good, 
so I see a lot of opportunities coming up uh, in the future, as I pointed out. Revitalization will be a main driver for the whole retail landscape, and we're happy to uh, uh, to be one of the, the anchors there. Great. And Angelus, just just on, on one point as well. Um, you know, it, it was mentioned a little bit in the presentations around the, the sort of crossover between, you know, om, omni-channel especially, and the idea that um, there might be more kind of area set aside within some stores um, for distribution. Um, in terms of food retail, obviously here where I am in the UK, um, th there's, you know, a lot of focus at the moment, particularly in London and the biggest cities on on uh, e-commerce in terms of food and delivery. Um, what's the situation there in, in Germany? Is that something that you're particularly looking at or expecting to roll out? What, what's, what's your view on that side? Well, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, and also Henrique and the other contributed also, digitalization and say omnichannel, uh, uh, is one of the main key trends we've seen and also in the future. So the customer moves ahead, the customer has more options to shops uh, and more platforms or even is forced to do so uh, during the pandemic. But the impact of digitalization will uh, uh, depends on the, on, on the goods you sell. So as I said, good news is market share, online share of food retailing remain uh, respectively low and will do so in the future even if, uh, of course, online sales went up uh, in general the last uh, 12 months. Especially in, in Germany, I think this is for some key reasons you have to keep in mind when you uh, consider uh, online food delivery services. So for food, margins are very tight. And with that respect, logistic costs, especially in the rural areas, and uh, uh, not looking at monocentric uh, uh, regions like London or Paris or uh, the logistic costs are respectively very high. So, and uh, the coverage of food retail within the markets is uh, in brick and mortar stores is really dense, which is an advantage. I'll give you a, a key figure. So, 93% of the German population can reach an, an, a physical uh, a physical food store within five minutes drive time, and that's a tremendously good figure. Uh, it's it's more convenient often to jump by than to order online. But of course, nevertheless, digitalization will also come into uh, the world of food retailing. There's no doubt about it. So uh, we believe in the in the physical food store, but uh, 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 online distribution will be an additional channel which uh, will not replace physical outlets. But we therefore observe the market very consequently. And if many of you uh, might know, we uh, recently bought Reality Air, which is one of the leading German online platforms, and we flagged it uh, currently under the roof of Kaufland.de. Um, uh, step by today, uh, as from today, there's a big campaign running out uh, 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 for our customers, and that's that's a thing, a decisive move towards an omnichannel Kaufland customer experience. We see that uh, we see that uh, right now, especially for the non-food items. So it's not for food, uh, but of course, uh, our customer wants a Kaufland omnichannel experience, and that's what we do. No, interesting. Um, and um, for those who are who are tracking the logistics side, particularly this crossover as well of um, of logistics and retail, um, the next session that we'll be running on the fourth of May um, looks at the future of logistics real estate as part of the um, official program at Transport and Logistics, the the big fair, fair there. Anybody interested? Um, I've I've put the link in the chat to that, so feel free to register for that, and and that's free to register for. Um, I just wanted to pick up with you um, if if I. Can can, Jad, um, a question that came in from, from Mark Espineau, thanks very much for that, Mark, um, who was surprised to see that JLL is forecasting non-food sales growth to exceed that for online sales, especially given the significant base effects. Does the non-food retail sales forecast include the e-commerce sale of retailers uh, in this category? Um, that was a question that I felt I couldn't answer in the chat, Chad, so I don't, I don't know whether you've got to uh, want to pick that one up. Well, I'm happy to pick this up. Last year, when the lockdown measures were implemented, we have seen a significant shift in retail spending towards the online channel and we've seen real acceleration in growth there. And at the same time with store closures 
and also people being restricted, unable or unwilling to visit the stores. We have seen sort of the non-food sales uh, fall quite significantly last year. So from this low basis, we anticipate a solid growth because um, this will be driven by the fact that consumers will be able to sort of uh, go out again, spend. And let's be, um, if you really think about sort of the offering of online, yes, the online channel has welcomed new um, customers, but if you really think about the customer experience, has that significantly changed? Or was this only the, only the best alternative available in the current situation? And our view is that a lot of consumers, once they are able to go back to the offices and also go back to uh, go out shopping again, is that a large part of this uh, retail spending will also shift back towards sort of the traditional stores. And so the combination of consumers being able to pick up their former habits again, as we can also see in mainland China, um, and also um, with some of uh, people going out again, this is why we're anticipating a strong bounce back in uh, non-food sales that will benefit high streets, retail parks and shopping centres overall. Great, thanks very much, Chad. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in around retailers, particularly um, what retailers are taking space in the UK, European, US shopping centres, um, and what kind of space are they taking up? Um, and also one on, um, which retailers were mostly hit during the pandemic? Uh, was it those located in city centres or shopping centres outside of the cities? Um, so I don't know if anybody wants wants to pick up either of those kind of points on the retailer side. Yeah, I'll maybe <clears throat> go for the for the very last one. Uh, quite interestingly, we've seen completely different type of behaviour uh, country by country. Uh, in some countries, uh, out of town shopping centres the larger ones, and of course, I'm talking about the units which were opened, uh, um, suffered and in some benefited. Uh, two examples, Italy, uh, if you were out, out of the town, there was a problem because there was um, limitation uh, in respect of traveling out of the municipality, whilst in Sweden, we've seen tremendous growth because people tended to go to larger stores to larger hypermarkets uh, instead of uh, convenience uh, uh, units next door. In Poland, we've seen small units at the uh, at the ground floor of, of your of your uh, block actually uh, benefiting a lot and shopping centers suffering more. So I think there are different patterns, but overall, the more closer to transportation hubs and offices, the, the worse result. So yeah, if you if you are more close to population and uh, with all those limitations, then it it was quite resilient. Wherever it was connected with the city center, uh, it, it it was worse. But I think we shouldn't um, be too afraid about about this in the very long run, because of course before, and I think this is one of the trends which have been interrupted, as is, was mentioned before, right? Because before we've been talking about urban, about city centres, about retail coming back to city centres, suddenly these are suffering the most. But I can also see that even if the immediate hit was hard on those assets, the, the tenants are not questioning their long-term presence in those assets. They, they are still, um, and when we come to, let's say, negotiations with them about their, uh, about support to them, this is limited to short-term effects of that particular problem, but we, they are not questioning long-term presence in that. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Carol. Um, we've got around uh, two minutes left. I think we've answered all of your questions apart from, I saw that there was one from uh, Oliver for you, Carol, which was on um, repurposing um, non-dominant centres or space. Um, we, we'll try and pick that up in the, in the final kind of round of questions but um we're obviously here very focused um for everybody in terms of the opportunities so let's let's just pick up on on where everybody sees the opportunities at the moment um particularly looking at this sort of resilient retail space um and let's think about the the sort of i suppose um opportunities now and also over over i guess the next five years um Mike, let's let's start with you if we can. So what are you seeing in terms of, of, of opportunities for, for those people who may be looking to invest at the moment? Yeah, today, uh, and, and again, um, just to, to caveat this, I'm a, I'm a, 
I genuinely believe that the shopping centre universe will come back, as Carol and I have discussed many times in, in the way that he suggested. But today's opportunity, genuinely, I believe, is in the retail warehouse space. Um, and the reason for that is because of the flexibility and adaptability of the respective units and locations. Um, it's easier to evolve the retail as it is on the out of town retail parks than it is as Carol suggests earlier on the urban, more urban locations. Therefore, in the short term, retail warehousing for me is, is where the opportunity lies. What, what I think we have to be very careful of in terms of investing in this space is that, you know, retail is an operational asset class and needs the expertise around which to manage. And therefore, um, for me, what people have got wrong over perhaps the, the sort of last 10, 15 years is the underestimating how much money they need to put into their investments within retail to keep evolving with the times and therefore benefit from that capital expenditure. Um, and that's what people need to understand more of going forward. Therefore, the expertise piece is key. Today's opportunity, I think, is in the in the convenience anchored retail warehousing space. But that's not to say that the shopping centre space isn't um, isn't an opportunity and it absolutely will be. And those that are able to get that right in the medium term, I think will absolutely benefit at the same time. Great, thanks very much, Mike. Um, uh, Angela, just coming to you in, in terms of, uh, I suppose, let's let's look at where you see yourself and the, the kind of opportunities for your brand, especially um, in the next, you know, let's say in the next short term, but also over the next five years. Of course, perhaps let me, let me end with an opportunistic, uh, with an optimistic outlook. Uh, well, the future is one of the most exciting, I guess, for all of us, uh, as it ever was. <laughs> And never forget, food is investors' darling and definitely definitely became a core asset. So we are looking forward to realize more footfall anchors together uh, with you, uh, with investors, which haven't thought of uh, retail before, because I think it, there are many opportunistic uh, uh, chances in the future, especially for... Can you hear me? I, I double... Yes, we seem to have a we seem to have a bit of an echo. We'll so to keep it short, um, uh, we will also go into locations we never thought of before. Perhaps more shopping centres, more inner city. So happy to discuss. Let's see whether or not it's still happening. It is, uh, <laughs> uh, Henrika. Um, let, let's just let's just come to you um, in terms of where you're seeing the opportunities. I would say, given the echo, I keep myself short and sweet. So uh, we believe um, the opportunity lies in the in the K-shape uh, recovery, uh, in a in the first instance, and uh, in the second instance. Um, uh, it's always a question of an appropriate risk return profile. So uh, I leave it like this. Super, that's great. Uh, let's return to you, um, Angelus, because we seem to have resolved that problem now. <laughs> <laughs> All things were said. So happy, All to discuss things were said. <laughs> oh, happy to discuss new locations, new opportunities. Food will stay uh, a stable anchor. Super, great. Thanks very much, Angelus. Um, uh, let's let's pick up with you, Carol, on that. Um, now referring to, sorry, I, just to, just to in terms of where, or where you're seeing the opportunities in the next, you know, let's let's look short term and also in the next five years, Carol. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll not surprise anyone that I will say shopping centers, and I, I agree with with what Mike said that it's not going to be now. It's not going to be within a year. But I can see a shift in the, in the mindset of people. And if I say I would love to sh invest in shopping centers half a year ago, I will be switched off and I'm not switched off anymore. I hope at least uh, now. And that, that's, that's the change. That's indeed a change. Uh, it, it needs time and needs uh, some first movers uh, to, to change the negative uh, mindset. But if I look 12 months ago, uh, we've been really scared and we, we did expect a huge drop of everything and we are, after 12 or 13 months being in this situation, we have the same occupancy, virtually spot on the same occupancy as we had one year ago. Yes, we had to resign from some, some income, but the shopping centers are still there. 
we are lucky to to have good good products and but but that shows that if if the if the if the selection is right or was right then it's still sustainable and there was an opportunity for tenants to 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 run away we had massive amount of lease expiries in the in the meantime and they did stay and i'm very optimistic when it comes to this um it will of course not be immediately within one year back and we do believe that it will take a few years to to get back to the original levels but we are definitely not talking about end of retail for sure super thanks very much carol um sasha Well, also not surprising that we will remain focused on the grocery uh, real estate sector to start with in Germany. We will remain, uh, try to remain the number one expert um, and, and partner for the grocery operators. Um, so whatever comes and whatever the customer will ask for in the future that we are from the real estate part are prepared to to join their their, their journey and be, a, and be a real partner. That's uh, what we will be focusing on also in the future. And I think there's a lot to be done in left to be done in, in Germany. Super, thanks very much, Sasha. Um, and uh, and Chad, over, over to you. Do you uh, do you, do you believe the same as Mike? What what's your view? I absolutely uh, am aligned with sort of Mike's thinking. We, we will sort of anticipate continued liquidity and sort of that's, lo that's lucky, Chad. <laughs> the warehouse park. But I think what is encouraging to see is is, is to also hear that um, what, what the, the sort of the commitment from retailers to remain present in good quality locations, and this is where we anticipate the bounce back to materialize. And of course, we may see some weaker assets to fall away, but this is fully in in line with expectations of a retail market that's going to be a little bit more condensed but ultimately to becoming more resilient and also more productive as a whole. Okay, that's 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 absolutely super. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chad, for that. Um, and I believe watching it um, there in RealX, you weren't hearing the same bounce back that we were hearing. So I'm glad that you could hear everything fine and it was just us. Um, Thanks very much um, to all of the speakers. Thanks very much for, for sharing your views. Um, thank you for all those questions. Really interesting to get your, your feedback as well from, from everyone attending. Delighted to see so many people also attending this session focused on retail, which suggests that there is a desire and an appetite for this. Um, and I think also what was key from my perspective around this was also that, that discussion around the differentiation between different aspects of, of retail, um, because, you know, there are certainly areas that are interesting to invest in. Um, so thanks very much for joining us. Um, thank you again to all of the speakers. Do take a look at the, um, the presentations that are available online um, and do also download the um, the report from uh, from both Henrika and Mike there as well um, on the grocery retail because that's a very interesting read. Um, thanks very much and look forward to seeing it the next one. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Bye. Bye. Thanks, thanks everybody.